Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to what is the fourth in a series of webinars that have been sponsored by a group, uh, an ad hoc coalition called Engaging Scientists and Engineers in Policy, or ESAP. Uh, and the focus of that group is to really help empower scientists and engineers and students studying science and engineers, uh, engineering uh, to in, have the both the skills, the interest, who have an interest in engaging in policy to effectively do so at all levels of government. So today's webinar is focused on what we feel is a very important topic. Uh, and I am Toby Smith with the Association of American Universities. We are one of the members of ESEP. Uh, but today's topic is on academic programs relating to science policy, as well as uh, uh, co courses in science policy. And we have a significant interest in seeing those grow and informing people about what already exists because a lot of students in science and engineering courses don't really know what's out there and opportunities and are often very interested but don't know how to get engaged whether it's a, a, a semester course a whole a program because there are certificate programs and uh, actually minors or majors in science policy that you can pursue at different levels there are also shorter courses, and we'll hear a little bit about that in today's webinar. Um, so with that, I want to introduce our two speakers, uh, and I will begin with uh, Bill Von Billion, who is, for his day job, he is director of the MIT Washington office and really handles and directs MIT's government affairs here in Washington, D.C., dealing with policymakers, whether it's within the administration or uh, on Capitol Hill. But he is also involved in teaching science policy courses. Uh, MIT has an initiative, and I think Bill will talk more about it, the Science Policy Initiative, which is a group of students. And Bill uh, leads uh, during a week-long kind of open, or uh, during a month-long open period that MIT has in January, a week-long boot camp in science policy. He also teaches a science policy, uh, science policy, science and technology policy course at Georgetown University, and uh, an energy policy course at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, in addition to Bill, we have Francis Slakey. Francis's day job is he is the Associate Director for Public Affairs at the American Physical Society, uh, but he is also an Upjohn lecturer on physics and public policy at Georgetown University. And there I would say, and, and I think you'll be very interested to learn about Francis's course in science policy, which he describes as a hands-on project-based learning course. And what I know he has the students do is really applied and makes them get their hands dirty and actually try to affect policy in a way that a lot of science policy courses are much more just information. But Francis uh, really encourages students to get out and engage directly in policies. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Bill Van Dillink. Bill. Thanks, Toby. Um, I'll just go through some uh, some slides briefly. Um, the you know topic I want to talk about is how to build opportunities for students in science and tech policy, and talk about a couple of models um, at MIT, things that MIT is up to that might uh, might be of more general use. Um, so the first topic, as Toby suggested, is MIT Science Policy Initiative. So it's a, a primarily, although not exclusively, grad student group um, that supports work and focus on science and tech policy at MIT. They get about 50 folks to their regular you know, biweekly meetings, and they've got 400 overall participants. And they've got a number of activities. So the, the SPI program kind of provides some ideas for uh, possible student groups, undergraduate, graduate, schools, things that uh, things that it might provide some models for. So what are some of these programs? First, the kind of the general background for the group that kind of indoctrinates everybody is the Science and Tech Policy Boot Camp, a kind of week-long course. I teach four days of it. There's a fifth day that's taught by MIT faculty that are involved in, in sci-tech policy uh, in a month-long MIT semester. 
in January. The course began in, in 2007 and continues. Um, we try to limit the size so the real discussion can break out. So we've got 30 to 35 students. The SPI group kind of competitively selects them to make sure we've got a representative group from a range of departments and programs. Uh, the course features readings and then you know, I'll present on those readings and then student discussion leaders will kind of tear those apart. Uh, and then there's opportunity for student presentations as well. Uh, so it's a very strong backgrounder in the kind of basics of S&T policy, a particular focus on the federal R&D system, and how that works, how that thinks, how that's organized. Um, and then students can now take that course for, uh, for credit uh, some of the other programs that SPI has, they organize every year, working with my office in Washington, a congressional visit day. So they come down to, uh, to Washington for two days. The first day is kind of advocacy training, which we help with, and that AAAS helps with. Uh, then they organize meetings on the Hill, you know, based upon what their congressional districts are. So last year, for example, of 2015, they met with 51 congressional offices and seven members of Congress and Senators. Uh, they advocate for strong funding for federal R&D. Uh, it's, you know, it's a great eye-opener to how Congress works and operates. Uh, it's a real lesson and gives them a whole feel for how the congressional process works. And then in the springtime, they have something called Executive Visits Days. Uh, Again, 20 to 25 students come down from MIT. They visit a slew of federal agencies and NGOs, you know, White House OSTP, the State Department, uh, NSF, the Department of Energy, RPE, EPA, USAID at State, DARPA, NIH, World Bank. These are all typical visits, usually you know, a couple of hours, and they'll meet with you know, from one to two to three kind of scientists and folks involved in policy making of these organizations, sometimes the leadership of these organizations, they really learn about how these agencies do s and policy. And they also learn a lot about what potential career options might be. So these are two mainstay briefing programs that our office helps a bit with, but the students really organize themselves that have proven to be great introducers for the students on how things work. So, for example, the photographs that you're seeing, this is a group of students that came down uh, last year in front of the White House for Executive Visits Day. And this is a group of students in front of the Library of Congress, some of the group that came down for congressional meetings. There's other things this group does. The group working with a, with a faculty committee, a senior faculty at MIT, really organized the whole science and technology policy certificate program at MIT for credit. And they picked a menu of courses already being offered at MIT that students participate in, plus the boot camp course and some other introductory courses. Um, and students who are interested in ST policy, in addition to their regular graduate degrees, can put this certificate program. They learn a lot about ST policy in this, uh, but it's also a good credential for looking for work on ST policy. The group has a program of campus speakers they bring in. For example, late this spring, they brought in Michelle Lee, who's head of the, the patent office. She's under the Secretary of Commerce. They do a lot of these. They do you know, bi-weekly lunch discussions. And they have a whole set of professional development activities. So these are some of the elements that an MIT student group has put together that I think could provide useful models at other schools for the kinds of things students can organize and put together. Then the other thing I wanted to talk briefly about is something that MIT calls the policy initiative model. Uh, this is, you know, MIT gets major funding from the federal government, from R&D agencies. It's historically had a view that it's supposed to help, uh, that it ought to be providing a service to the nation. So one way we're able to kind of give back some of the research support that we get is by bringing you know, what could be called policy presence back to the executive branch. Um, so these policy projects really serve as a justification for the continuing federal investment. Uh, 
can we bring some kind of return that's practical to the feds that are providing all this research support for underlying research. So we've done a series of major policy initiatives. Um, set of now 11 reports on a series of major energy technology topics, two reports on an area called convergence, a major two volume report on advanced manufacturing, a study of the importance of basic research that we call future postponed, a major online education report this spring. Uh, we've got a new environmental initiative that's underway. So these have built a lot of goodwill They've been much appreciated by the policy world. But over time, they typically translate into research for MIT researchers. They have been a great way to introduce students into major policy topics and policy research. So there's a series of benefits here. One, of course, is for the people who can use the report. Another is to get MIT organized around these big issues. But the third major benefit is to create a community of students that work on these that learns a great deal from them. So the energy initiative model has resulted in a series of major energy studies from studying the nuclear fuel cycle to carbon capture and sequestration to solar to the future of the grid. Uh, major studies that have been very influential and, and help create research agendas in the agencies. Um, the convergence initiative, and these are some of the researchers here, uh, led by engineers and, and life scientists at MIT that have argued the case for the merger of health research, life science research, biology with engineering and the physical sciences for a whole new research model on how progress can be made in the health sciences. And a new report on that just came out this past, uh, this past June, which really tries to set a, a strategy for, how, for different areas of research that need to be undertaken. This approach has been picked up by the administration, the Brain Initiative, DARPA's new Biological Technologies Office, the administration's new Precision Medicine Initiative. These are all examples of major convergence research projects. A third area is on advanced manufacturing. A team of MIT faculty developed a two-volume study around these issues uh, after the great crash of 08 and 09. Uh, began thinking hard about what was happening to American manufacturing. Um, as those ideas began to gel, a bunch of them were picked up by the administration into its advanced manufacturing partnership. So the ideas translated into policy uh, and had, frankly, a significant effect on the whole menu, including manufacturing institutes, of policies that, uh, that have been implemented and, that, and the congressional legislation that's failed on those. So another example of major policy report that results in, in activity. Uh, I'll mention a third, uh, the future postponed, which really looks at something that AAU calls the innovation deficit, that we're just not investing in science and technology research at the level we need to build the innovation system. So we have a lot of studies about you know, what did investment in research give us? What did all this basic research lead to? So we, we can track that, we can track it into the information revolution, for example. But we have very little work on what happens on when you cut research, when you reduce research levels. What won't we get? And this report tries to look hard at that. It's speculative, we, we develop, which of course is always a problem with science, but we develop you know, ways to try and make that a really authoritative look through kind of re science reviews of, of these different studies. So those are some, those are two of the main things that MIT has worked on in the science and technology policy area. One, the students put together the science policy initiative, which I think is kind of a model for other student groups, the kinds of things they do. Um, and then the second is this policy initiative model, a major interdisciplinary cross-school studies that involve scientists and engineers, but also political scientists, economists, management experts, international affairs experts, really coming together to study a deep technology question with big social implications. And we've done a series of these, and a number of them actually have been quite influential on in policy. They are a very good way 
to bring students with an interest in this area into this territory. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. So if I had to summarize my teaching approach in eight words, these would be the eight words. Think outside the textbook, get outside the classroom. I'm going to spend just a few minutes telling you what that means. Um, I'm going to talk about the results, and then I'll say a bit about how I got this approach approved by Georgetown, by faculty, chairs, deans. So I teach my classes through the Georgetown Program on Science and the Public Interest. And since we're in D.C., I feel obliged to have a mission statement. So everybody in D.C. has a mission statement. Here's our mission statement. So through hands-on project-based learning, Georgetown University's program of science public interest teaches actionable innovation, equips students to apply scientific problem solving skills to complex global challenges. So the key phrases there are hands-on project-based learning and actionable innovation. And students actually have to produce things in the classes, as you'll see, and they also have to have some kind of impact, and you'll see that as well. So that's the mission. I put it into practice in two classes. The spring class that I teach focuses on domestic issues. The fall class I teach focuses on, uh, on global issues. But both of them work exactly the same way. So I teach primarily junior and senior science majors and graduate students. They break into groups. They identify some social challenge out there, some social problem, preferably one that nags at them. The more it nags at them, the better it is. They develop a response, and then they have to get off campus, and they have to advocate for their solutions. So that approach to teaching creates a lot of firsts for my students, particularly those who, as freshmen and sophomores, just took the standard range of, of bio courses, physics courses, chem courses. So uh, the firsts are suddenly now they're taking a course that has no written exams. They're taking a course that has no textbook. And for the first time, they're working on a problem that actually hasn't been solved yet. So that's a lot of firsts. And so here is actually the typical reaction of students. Um, and I got to confess that, that I actually, when I was first teaching, contributed to that sense of panic because I was, uh, I was discovering a lot of stuff along the way. I made a lot of mistakes along the way. Now I've been doing this for about a decade. Lots and lots of mistakes along the way. I'm happy to talk more about those. Um, I can tell you about the mistakes in a minute. But for now, I just want to focus on outcomes and give you a sense for, for where all this has led. So I'm going to tell you briefly about two groups from last semester, from spring 2016. I'll tell you briefly what they did so you get a feel for uh, the course and the expected outcomes. And so uh, first group I'll tell you about group of pre-meds, uh, they'd all gotten into medical school, um, the medical school of their choice, but in thinking about the process, they all realized that the only way they were competitive for med school was because they actually had done shadowing. They had spent time in a hospital beside a doctor doing the rounds. And it turns out medical schools expect that. Right? They don't want their applicants to have a theoretical interest in medicine. They want to know that their applicants have actually experienced medicine firsthand and they're making a decision to go to medical school based on that. So what the student group realized in my class is that that requirement for shadowing puts some students across the country at an immediate disadvantage. Right? So if, if you're a student that doesn't have approximate medical school and you can't shadow, you got no shot at getting into medical school. So as a result, there are students all across this country who are severely disadvantaged because of their location. Fine. So how do you fix that? And the students had their first clever idea, which is, well, what about the VA system? There are VA hospitals everywhere. And they showed me a map of VA hospitals. And sure enough, there are VA hospitals everywhere. Uh, great, but how do you influence the VA? Well, uh, Congress. Congress actually has jurisdiction over the VA. Congress could actually require the VA hospitals to develop shadowing programs. So the students developed a very persuasive script for this. We spent a lot of time uh, teaching students how to take some problem and solution and persuasively communicate it. They did that. Uh, off they went to Congress. They had several meetings with congressional staff. That staff took an immediate interest. And now let me just jump right ahead to the result. They got it in legislation. 
So uh, they wrote the, the, the draft legislation that actually got in the House Appropriations Bill. There it is on page 48. I got it circled up there. It's a military construction appropriations bill. And the committee recognized the obstacles young professionals face in shadowing, and it created the program. So uh, is st when they started the semester, they had little to no knowledge of policy and politics. But by the end of the semester, they had drafted legislation and actually gotten it into an appropriations bill. So, um, so let me briefly tell you about one other project because not every student group actually works on legislation. So let me give you one more example from last semester. So um, there was a group of biology majors concerned about invasive species. And you know, one thing we do in the class is take the big concern, all the students come in with a big concern, a colossal concern, and we have to find a way to narrow it down to actually something that's actionable. So in their case, their concern about invasive species, we narrowed it down to one in particular, the snakehead fish that's been so destructive in, um, in regional waterways here in DC, Chesapeake Bay watershed. So what they came up with was um, a, you know, a pamphlet, a manifesto, I'm not quite sure what to call it, a guidebook um, for going after the snakehead. And target it, catch it, uh, and then a recipe for tossing it on a pan and eating it. Okay, so really just a whole new approach to alerting people about invasive species. Extremely clever, terrific sense of humor, uh, but also very carefully researched, vetted with conservation biologists, every word of it. Um, if you have a spare minute, I encourage you to take a look at what they came up with. It's on invasivehitlist.com. And their result is uh, their book, there's a picture of it, Invasive Hit List, the snakehead, uh, was purchased by the Bureau of Land Management, will now be distributed by the Bureau of Land Management. But they like it so much that not only did they purchase copies, they have contracted with the students to produce brochures on two more invasive species. So that gives you a feel for individual projects. Um, in summary, over the last few years, here's what's happened. So three student groups have actually had their proposals passed by Congress, signed into law by the president. Uh, groups have received independent funding to pursue, pursue their projects, not only here in the United States, but also in India, in Mali, in Argentina. They routinely present their projects and proposals to companies. And most recently, it was The Gap, Coca-Cola, Procter Gamble. And they often end up working with those organizations once they make the pitch. And they work not only during the semester, but even beyond that. And most recently, that happened with a group that is working with CVS Pharmacy and a group working with the U.S. Soccer Federation. I have one group that's currently patenting their idea, and they're forming an NGO. And then uh, had a group that actually established their own company, Bedrest LLC. So part of the reason I'm putting that list up there is to show you that while many students actually work on uh, legislation with the federal government, government many of them don't. Um, you don't have to be in D.C. to make this type of course work. I mean, in general, what I'm teaching is effective civic engagement. So students can work with any entity to get things done. So a group worked with CVS Pharmacy to get work done on antibiotics. A group worked with U.S. Youth Soccer on a concussion project. Um, they could have been from any university anywhere in the country and done that. And the fact is both of those groups looked at pending legislation on both antibiotic resistance and on concussions, decided that that legislation either was moving too slowly, didn't have a shot, didn't address the right issues, and they decided to work outside the legislative process. But the same science policy goals are being achieved, but they're doing it by working with industries or with NGOs. So, I had mentioned earlier that I made a lot of mistakes along the way, so let me make a confession here. There were plenty of them. Um, I made plenty of mistakes in the classroom, topic selection, group size, pacing, workspace, syllabus, all kinds of errors I made. Eventually ironed those out. Um, I made a lot of mistakes outside the classroom, and this is something that all of you may face, which is I had actually assumed that faculty and chairs would value exposure to science policy. Not the case. Um, I had to find other arguments to actually um, get these classes through. I'm happy to go into more detail, talk to any of you. Anybody can contact me afterwards if they'd like to, uh, to know more about some of these, these issues. But let me tell you where it all led. Um, so Georgetown is now establishing a minor based around the classes, and it's called Science and Social Change. Um, 
and we're in the process of approving the minor. I've already gone through three different executive committees and, and got unanimous votes of support in all of them. So a big change from where I was 10 years ago. And I'll tell you, if there's one primary thing that enabled this to happen, that has enabled the university to unanimously endorse this sort of teaching, um, it's because I made clear what the curriculum arc is and what the learning goals are. And, uh, and so this, as simple as it is, condenses about eight years of my labor. Um, I can't say enough about this. You know, if, if you need to get approval, uh, you absolutely need to clearly state your learning goals. Um, and this chart has made all the difference in the world for me. It condenses a lot of work I've done. Um, science policy courses are, are sufficiently outside the mainstream science curriculum that you need to present how they build off the existing curriculum and how they contribute to the existing curriculum. Deans need to hear that. Executive committees need to hear that. And to the extent that you want faculty support, the faculty's got to hear it too. Um, so lots of work to go down this path. I'm happy to keep in touch with anybody who wants to go in this direction. Um, I can tell you about some of the problems I faced, how I got around it, so you can avoid the pitfalls, save yourself time. But i got to say one last thing, and that is that teaching a course like this is tremendously fulfilling. Um, subject matter changes every semester because it's based on whatever the students actually select as their project topics. So my struggle is always to try to stay far enough ahead that I can actually teach the students something. But inevitably, I reach a point where the students know more about their topic than I do. And I'll confess that at that moment, when they reach that point, when the student becomes the teacher, it is uh, very fulfilling in its own way. So thanks. So, Francis, Bill, I want to thank you. I think that was a great kickoff to what I hope is going to be uh, a very fruitful set, kind of q and I'm going to kick off questions. I do want to mention to people watching, please submit your questions online via the chat function uh, because we do want to ask as many questions in the next uh, half hour or so here as we can get through. So I want to start... Um, you know, with one of the questions we got prior to to this, which I hear all the time from students in science and engineering, is they'd love to learn about more policy, but and, and, and take a course, but they just don't have the time. So, what advice do you give them? How do they get? How can they get dip their feet into the water without actually taking, for instance, the course that you offer, Francis? Um, just any any thoughts? Sure, well, let me break it up in, okay. into different pieces. So, so first of all, if you're an undergrad and you're a chemistry major, I agree, you don't have the time. Right? So right. we've all seen what their, uh, what their curriculum is like, and they have almost no elective space. Chem majors have almost no elective space. But physics majors do, bio majors do, computer science majors do. So, so first thing I'd say is if you're an undergrad, um, science major, you, you actually may have room in your curriculum to take a course like this. That's the first thing. Uh, for graduate students, I teach graduate students as well, but, you know, for them, the trick to getting in the classroom is discussing it with their advisor, and they've got to persuade their advisor that it's worth their time to, uh, to take time away from what would be the lab, the bench, and actually going into the classroom and learning something like this. And so part of what I do is try to enable them with, with useful conversations they can have with their advisor to make that happen. So I know that your, the premise of your question was, what if you can't take a class? But what I'd like to encourage people is that there are ways to do it. And, and even though it seems a bit daunting, um, it's a matter of having the, you know, the right argument or, or looking at your curriculum and finding space for that elective. Bill? Yeah, let me add a few thoughts, Toby. Um, you know, this field of science and tech policy, you know, I wouldn't call it established space. It fits in between a whole series of academic territories. Uh, which, you know, makes this complicated. But there are courses now increasingly being stood up in places like public policy schools and in, these, in, in uh, universities in general that kind of cover this territory. So, you know, one option for sure is that if you're not going to be able to take a course and devote the time needed to the course, you can start reading in 
for the system. Um, and, you know, I'd be happy to share the syllabus for you know, my Georgetown course on energy technology area to the syllabus in the energy tech policy area. Um, but these are by no means alone. Um, by the way, of course, is there's a number of these around. I think you can search for them, you can search on the web and start to get a feel for what the literature looks like. And of course, Toby is author of, of the leading science and technology policy course book. It's another great way to, uh, to read into this. Um, and I'm sure that you know we can be sure to give some recommended readings as part of this yeah. part of this webinar that, that folks could start to read into. But it's you know like any field, you can't pick it up in five minutes of reading. It's not going to happen by reading an op-ed. You really need to kind of get a sense for the territory um, and, and kind of dig in. And if you're truly interested in it, there's there's a lot of things that, uh, that can be done. Francis, of course, is a great example. Some of the things that the MIT students, but increasingly students around the country are organizing in terms of science policy initiatives on their own campuses. These, are, these all present growing opportunities. And the AAAS is doing a lot of work in this regard. And there's another opportunity, too, which they're a professional scientific organization. A lot of scientific organizations now have congressional visit days, some targeted specifically at students so they can contact their professional society and just see if that opportunity exists. So actually, that raises another question. Um, so like, since you work in a scientific society, what's the role of scientific societies? Do they offer trainings at their, at their um, society meetings or opportunities? I think every society takes a slightly different approach. There's no uh, one way to do this. So I'll just speak to the way that the American Physical Society does it. So if you're a physics major, if you're a physics grad student, you have the opportunity to engage in our uh, contact Congress days and our congressional visit days. And we do have primers. And so before congressional visit days, we hold um, sessions with the visitors and rehearse their scripts. So we do a, a generic webinar. And then we narrow it down and, and actually do one-on-ones with individuals to try to sharpen their scripts so that they can be persuasive when they uh, when they come to uh, Bill, I wanted to pick up on the science policy initiative because I know that that has um, it was the genesis for the the week-long camp that you teach at. I also know there's been a growth in those types of un those those clubs in the SPI has now been replicated at campuses, um, and we've seen them starting to come in addition to MIT to participate in these lobbies. I was wondering if you had any comments because I think that's another way, maybe for those who don't have time for a course, just to get involved with a group of other students that have an interest. And I've seen I've been out to speak in a number actually of these these various groups that are forming. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that is a great way. I mean, if you've got if you've got an interest in this and you're a student um, at the undergraduate or graduate level, um, yeah, this is a way to make this project manage and to get a lot of feedback and a support group kind of built around you. And you know, putting one of these there's obviously a number of these now at, uh, at different schools. I think that's a growing number. The AAAS have been working along with AAU and supporting uh, supporting. So these are established, but you can also kind of you know, go online and check out some of these, these organizations and see the kinds of things they do. You know, at MIT, we found that you know, getting hands-on experience early triggers a tremendous amount of interest. So there's a variety of ways to participate in Congressional Visits Day kind of activities. Francis has just summarized those. That's a great eye-opener we found for students to get a feel for how the system actually works and how to participate in it, how to move it, right, how to understand it. Um, you know, spending time with the executive branch R&D agencies and NGOs is another great kind of hands-on experience. And once you kind of do those and kind of learn what this world is like, then you're kind of ready in a way to lead in and uh, start to, you know, kind of look at the literature in science and tech policy, but with a more concrete kind of understanding. So these are the kind of efforts that MIT's SPI group puts front and center, you know, on its, uh, on its agenda. So I want to follow up, Bill. You mentioned um, that in terms of the, uh, 
ability of students to get involved in some of these reports that have been done. Can you, can you explain that a little bit more in the, the kind of um, that opportunity? Yeah, I mean, MIT has hit on this model and, and of these major policy issues, and frankly, not a whole lot of schools are doing these. Um, the mode that MIT has tried is to, you know, make them very interdisciplinary and bring a whole series of fields to bear on deep policy questions that come out of science and technology uh, kinds of issues. Um, you know, so they're big projects, um, but they've proven to be a great home for students, for example, interested in energy technologies, right? This is a great way for them to kind of learn a landscape and to kind of master the knowledge, but also master the accompanying policy framework. To meet federal officials, to work with you know, career folks who spend their careers at companies or startups or um, in research organizations working you know, on these different kind of research areas and then attempt to pull the threads together with economics, with pub public policy, with political science, with international affairs, and so on, sort of tying together the, the science and the engineering with the policy framework. So it's uh, these big efforts at MIT have been, you know, I think, very useful for policymakers, but frankly, extremely useful for the student participants in really learning a territory. So I'm um, these. Energy reports have been going on now since about 2007 with a major energy initiative at MIT. Um, the number of students who have been through these reports and participated in SPI, been through these policy activities that are now actually working in the Department of Energy, you know, astonishes mm -hmm. me. They're all over the place. Uh, so let me just say, though, that you don't have to do you know, the major report for a national audience. There's lots of activities on this kinds of scale. Francis's course offers a perfect kind of glimpse of the kind of effects you have where you can engage with teams, you know, not in a, in a one or two year report project, but in a, in a more focused, you know, semester long kind of project. Uh, every state doesn't necessarily have a Congress, but every state's got a state legislature. And the engagement of colleges and universities in Public policy process in their states, you know, the same problems exist at the, same, at the state level. The same challenges are there. Uh, there's a host of really interesting science and tech initiatives that, that can be done at the state level, or for that matter, at the metropolitan city level or the regional level. Also, you know, I look at some of the project students have worked on over the last several years, and those are all things that could have been done at a city or at a state level. But there's one common thread to everything that we've been talking about, which is immersion, right? So that one of the best ways to learn this is to actually do something, do a report. In my class, I have to do a hands-on project, but that's certainly uh, one of the most effective ways to actually learn how, to, how science policy is done. Now, one of the fun things about these reports when they come out is that uh, the team that worked on the report comes down, usually almost always including the leading student research team and their participants. So we present, my office helps organize the presentations of these reports. So typically there's some forum at some think tank or uh, national academies, et cetera, um, which they're part of. But then we go on meetings, usually for a couple of days, briefing the policymakers. And the students are in that game, learning how to put their pitches together, right? Which is a great thing to see. So I want to talk a little bit and quiz you both since you both developed these courses. Talk about the develop, talk about the actual how you develop your reading list, where you get the materials, what what thought goes into that. We got a question specifically from somebody out who's watching who's who's taught one of these courses. And mm -hmm. is there any recommendations in terms of course development?
took me a long time to get my music all up. And so I, I, do a, I rely a lot on learn by doing. So they learn a lot about the political process by just going up to Congress and advocating for their solution. And, and as, they, as they inevitably fail in their first conversation up there, they come back, we talk it through, they figure out what they did wrong, and they also learn the process. So, um, so it's a pretty streamlined approach. And as a result, I've let go of textbooks and let the laboratory do the teaching. And the laboratory uh, of civic engagement are the industries working on a problem, the NGOs working on a problem, or Congress itself. So the, the course that I teach, Toby, is a you know more traditional, um, you know kind of course with you know extensive readings and you know there is no standard curriculum. I mean, this right. is an evolving field right. that changes all the time. There's new S and T organizations that are being added to the menu. You have to turn around and shift your syllabus after RPE gets in bed or Cyclotron Road gets thrown out by the Department of Energy as a kind of a new model. Um, but it's, you know, I've worked on collecting literature that I think gets across a series of kind of core ideas to the students from kind of growth economics to innovation organization and innovation organization in a series of areas at the, at the federal agency level. And there's very different models in the feds, as you well know, right? right? The National Science Foundation looks a lot different than DARPA or RPE. What are the variety of those models? What do they do? Um, and then how do you do the translation? How is innovation at the face-to-face -face level organized? What does that innovation group look like? What are their rule sets? And then how does the tech transfer start to occur? How does the startup and stand-up process look? And then you can look at it in a series of fields. You know, the biotech territory is really different than the information technology territory, which is really different than the advanced manufacturing territory. So you can take a sector split and, and look at these rule sets as they evolve. So that's the kind of stuff that my course attempts to do. But again, it's on it's on a context of doing a lot of practical stuff. So we really encourage the students that take the boot camp at MIT to do congressional visits day, to do executive agency visits day, so they get a real sense live what these kinds of institutions are like. So for a student interested in science policy, in let's just say they're in the College of Engineering at a large campus, how do they find? Because oftentimes the course won't be within engineering; it might be someplace else. Any advice on how they actually find those courses? So, so ESEP is working as serving as a warehouse right. for some of these things, yeah. right? So, yeah. so this is and one I'll, place I'll, to turn, and maybe good. talk about that the first. Let me do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, well, one of the questions that come in, and I actually want to say we are in the process of developing on the ESEP webpage um, information about comprehensive courses, so like the minor program, the, the, the minor in science policy that you developed at Georgetown would be something we want to put up there, uh, as well as other science policy certificate programs or actual programs, graduate programs. We don't have the level of individual courses, but it's something we actually, a question came in, and I think it's something we should start looking at. We have a pretty good idea of people who are teaching these courses. And we should be trying to get more information about that. And on another website, Bill mentioned the, the, the book that I helped to write, which is used as a textbook. On that site, we actually have syllabi from people who taught courses. So the person who asked a little bit about course development, I think sharing those different approaches, because there are multiple approaches. And then when you go from the, uh, I guess, the pure science policy to more like the course you teach on energy policy or health policy, then it's a very different approach than what you might want to share. But I think there is an effort to really try and make it much easier for people who would like to teach science policy to do that. So what I promise from the ESEP side is that's something we're committed to trying fostering a group of faculty who are, or, or people who've actually been practitioners in, in policy, but are scientists uh, in, in doing research and run a lab, but they might have done a stint at NSF or held a position, uh, uh, a high level position within administration. So we're trying to encourage them to teach more and then to get uh, to get involved. So that raises another question. Is one of the well, let me add to this. So, so, so if you're a student yeah. and you're waiting for that site to develop, but you want answers now, uh, on campus, you know, you go to your dean, uh, you've got an advisor in the dean's office who's aware of the course listings. And if you want to find out about my course or Bill's course, for example, if you were at Georgetown, 
You go into the dean, you say, I'm interested in this subject matter, what can I take? And it's the dean's responsibility to sift through and see what they can find. And, and they're pretty responsive. Although I do have to say, I watched the MIT students at the Science Policy Initiative go through this process. So MIT doesn't have a public policy school. And uh, these courses were scattered everywhere. I mean, there were some in the economics department, there were some in the business school, and there was like entrepreneurship and startups, and early stage innovation. There were some in the international affairs area. There were for sure highly relevant courses in engineering and, and an upper in science. They were all over the place. And they were hard to find. Um, and the people did not necessarily know each other. Right? So one of the great services that SPI did was create a certificate program. And they really explored with the departments uh, just what their offerings were. And then went through the different syllabi for these different courses and began to construct a menu of all the stuff that's available. And then put it into areas that seemed to fit together, which didn't necessarily match up on departments at all, right? Um, and then, you know, in, with, with the help of a very strong faculty committee, in the end created a four credit certificate program that keeps refreshing this menu so that anybody at MIT who's interested in these kinds of courses now can go to a place and kind of track this thing. So that's a real service that a student organization or a team of students can play for their others. I think it's a really good early stage kind of activity. I actually think that's a really good point is that the students can be drivers of trying to promote cross-campus activities. And also, the other thing is um, pushing that people who have expertise, because one thing is to find mentors. And oftentimes on campuses, I think, I don't know if any of you have comments on that. I mean, one of the problems is finding the people who have expertise in science policy and then engaging them a little bit more, whether, again, I mentioned the people who actually have served on federal advisory committees or come to Washington as a rotator might have actually done a fellowship uh, working for a member of Congress. And have, but, but finding those folks, as I work with some of these groups, that's one of the biggest problems. They are looking for content people. And I can, I can point them towards people right on their campus who they don't even know exist. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Or you sure. Let's say you're running, and let's yeah. imagine the student that's running in barriers, right? Yeah. So they're, they're interested. They can't find it in some obvious place in, in the course uh, descriptions. They go to their dean, and maybe in this case, the dean doesn't have the answers. They're sort of left on their own. You know, there is one opportunity available to every student everywhere in this country that doesn't require the university, and that's engage in your local uh, campaigns, your local election campaigns, right? So what a great way to learn. Uh, you, you can actually volunteer your services to a, a political campaign. You're going to learn politics. You'll get an exposure to policy, um, and they probably won't say no. So they're always looking for help. So, so that I'd say, you know, if, if, you're re, if you're hitting walls in your campus, recognize there is something out there that you can participate in. So I want to talk about the culture, because one of the other challenges is, is, is overcoming. And Francis, you mentioned, you know, trying to work with faculty who's a student might want to take a course. But I often hear from students, my advisor is not going to let this go, or they're, whether it's a, taking a course or Maybe they want to do an internship over the summer, but their advisor wants them to work in the lab. I, yeah. Any thoughts on how we start to change? And I, I mean, sure. I know that's one of the efforts of ESEP is to try and push and say this is really important that scientists learn these skills early because it is, from our view, fundamentally important that they know, know uh, the very processes that drive both the policy practice and funding for these? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And, and the situation is much different now than it was you know, 10, 15 years ago when I started working in this area. I think there's a couple arguments available to every student right now that, that didn't exist back then. And so, so why don't you just talk about the, the current arguments. So one of them is there's a growing awareness in the academic scientific community that uh, the majority of students that are being trained are not going to end up being professors. Yeah. And so as a result, they've got to develop um, additional skill sets that make them competitive in other careers. So the more exposure they get to other skills, the more exposure they get to other career choices, all the better. I think there's a growing awareness among faculty that they have to allow students to have that experience. 
And the other thing that has changed is the requirement on every grant for broader impact. And what we're discovering is that uh, faculty are much more willing to have their students engage in some of these activities because they're realizing it's helping them explain the broader impact research, which is required for funding now uh, to get an NSF grant. So, so those two arguments have made a big difference, I think, packaged the right way. Um, any, uh, any grad student can at least make a compelling case to their advisor. That doesn't mean their advisor will say yes, but I think there's a compelling case to be made. I actually just want to highlight, because I know a, a chemistry uh, faculty member at um, UCSD who actually is using and, and has created a program to encourage students into policy internships. That is what he uses as his broader impact. Right, and we're, I just do, think we're doing that at Georgetown. Great stuff. Too. Right, and so I for think faculty watching who are applying for NSF grants, don't forget the policy option as yeah. a way to expand what you're teaching, what students are engaged in. Okay. So let me add a, another uh, another vignette on that uh, in terms of you know how do students stand these groups up? And look, a group that's going to be oriented to flying 30 kids to Washington. For two days, you know, probably spending, definitely spending two nights. Uh, where are they going to get the money? For this? So they're going to have to shake down their schools, you know, to get the airfare. Um, it's just too expensive a proposition to expect the students to cover. So the science policy initiative team at MIT discovered that when they explained to the deans that they were going down to advocate for science R and D that suddenly they had a very sympathetic audience. They explained how they were going to organize to do this. They explained how the advocacy training was going to take place. They explained that you know, they were in the process of setting, you know, last year's group did 51 meetings with congressional offices, which is, you know, we're talking 10% of the Congress in one day. And it's an astonishing, an astonishing performance. So um, they found a very sympathetic um, based upon the kind of you know, opportunities that this creates in a larger sense for science, which all of the deans were facing you know, R&D cutbacks. And when they discovered the power of students engaging, frankly, with their peers, because the students are the same age as most congressional standards, it's a very interesting uh, kind of combination. And, you know, and I share you know, the points that you all have made about careers you know, a small number of, of students are going to end up, you know, on the faculty of colleges and universities teaching science. There's going to have to be other career pathways that are not going to these fields. Um, and science policy is a significant emerging territory for a lot of interesting work. And so this is another opportunity that deans have come to see uh, as, you know, as an important kind of offering. So and let's see you distinguish the different audiences, right? So, so I responded saying, well, here's what you need to tell your advisor. That's not the only person who needs to be persuaded. This is, this is an argument you take to the deans. And so right. you can who talk about you. this in right. slightly you different ways, ways, depending on who needs to be persuaded by I, I just want to give a shout out to AAAS, who's been running this, uh, yeah. this effort called Catalyzing Advocacy in Science Engineering. It really boils down in about two days what their um, science and technology policy fellows who go up to Capitol Hill and into agencies get you know, over two week period, but it's a crash course in science policy. The great news about that, I think to those of you who may be wondering out there, is my institution really going to support this stuff, is we found that there's a tremendous interest and willingness on the part of whether it's vice presidents for research, graduate school deans to actually pay for, in this instance, it's two students per institution to come from Washington and take this course. So we need to expand those opportunities. I think interested in doing that. We're running down on time. I have two more quick areas I want to cover. Inter we get a lot of questions about international students. Is there a way they can play a role in U.S. science policy? And I'm, it, I know it's a challenge. There are certain places, if you want an internship, you can't work in certain locations. But I'm just wondering, what advice would you give to students who are not U.S. citizens as to how they might get involved? Well, I'll just say that if at the Science Policy Initiative, yes. international students are frequent participants. Okay. Obviously, many of them have an intention of studying here for yep. graduate students. Um, but the door is open to them to participate in this, and they participate in congressional visits, they're in the executive visit state programs, as well as the boot camp. Yes. 
and frankly find these quite useful, whether they're planning to stay in the US or coming back. These are eye openers for them. And you know, Congress doesn't close its doors to the United States anybody, you know, but those doors are open. So they're they're effective and interesting contributors to this. That's good. All right. And I'll just add to that actually you spark something in that there are actually some really important issues that international students should be involved in. You know, pushing for the ability to stay if you get a degree. Yes. Uh, export control issues issue. that we're dealing with all the time. So there's some issues I think that are unique to international students and scholars that mean they're even more important to have involved and think about those issues. I also know I've worked with a number of Canadian uh, students and there's a lot of opportunities back home and there's more interest now in comparing different science policy efforts across countries. And some international organizations like OECD or where there's real opportunities in science policy, I think that can be pursued as well. So last question, students, I think, we've talked about students coming to Washington, being engaged. Oftentimes I think students say, but well, I make a real difference. I mean, shouldn't it be a dean, shouldn't it be somebody uh, you know, who runs a major research lab, aren't they gonna have more of an impact being engaged in policy than I would? Any thoughts on that? Sure. I mean, look, last January, there was no shadowing program that existed uh, in the VA. Six months later, it's students who did it. And I've got a number of stories from my class of the students doing these things. They can get it accomplished. So um, absolutely, they can get things done. No question about it. I have seen it happen. I mean, I described this briefly earlier, Toby. Uh, but when you know, students go in to meet with congressional staff in the Congressional Business State Program. Um, they are contemporaries, right? Not an old guy like me. They're contemporaries. And the students work on their advocacy skills and typically try to get down the major research project they're engaged in to kind of a, you know, a one minute elevator speech about what the importance is of the research they're doing and what it is, right? And when they make the case and in many cases, this is just jaw-dropping jaw research. I mean, this is save the world stuff, right? And it's a very powerful message. Uh, so frankly, you know, my office, the Washington office for MIT, has really decided that our most effective advocacy tool uh, on the Hill is really the power of these student voices. That's, that's, that's a great note to and uh, I want to talk just a little bit about resources, some resources that are out there. We talked about student groups that actually spun off of the MIT group. I know there is a, a national organization called the National Science Policy Group. They have a website. So anybody who's interested to see if there is a group on your campus, look there. If there's not a group, um, maybe it's something you could consider trying to foster or stimulate whether you're a faculty member, because oftentimes these groups do really well if there's an advisor or somebody supporting them, or um, a grassroots movement from students creating such a group. And those are usually graduates and some have undergrads in there. Um, uh, in terms of resources, I mentioned um, the website that I'm affiliated with, and that's sciencepolicy.us, and that's a good place to go for a number of different resources. On, on teaching science policy, that's where the syllabi are that I mentioned. Um, and I want to make a pitch for AAAS because there's a lot of really good resources from budget information, things on policy, on the AAAS website. So that's another one. Um, and finally, in terms of what ESEP is planning, uh, we will be planning future webinars. Our next one, I believe, is going to be on career opportunities in science policy within federal agencies and the government. We're going to have some people come in and talk. We don't have a date for that yet. But make sure to check out our previous webinars, uh, which have been on the federal budget, a process which have been on science policy toolkits if you want to engage are there you know these were actually on on some scientific societies and a group called the science coalition actually gives information to help people engage in policy and go up to congress and or meet their own individual members of congress or their, their, their senate staff um, and the first one was with rush holt so i i, I recommend those and we will stay, the other thing we're developing is an online portal for individuals, whether it's students or practitioners and people who are already in policy to start engaging with each other. And that will be done through the new online platform that AAAS has created called Trellis. 
And for students, I'm going to say this is a great opportunity because this will give you access to people like the two speakers today who we hope to get on there and engage in a dialogue so you can actually meet people from who are actually in careers in science policy and there can be dialogues online. So stay tuned for how to get involved in ESEP online through the TELUS platform. So with that, I want to thank Bill and Francis for your time. And uh, I want to also thank everybody who tuned in um, and hope this was a useful webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Toby. Thanks, Toby.